be our talking stick. And I have one question to get you guys started with, which is that um, if we're looking at Eric's uh, tools, uh, they're not run by a large corporation such as Google or Wikipedia uh, with the monopoly status or anything like that, but they're rather used by a bunch of hobbyists. In that application, do you see a potential for civic disobedience through robots? And if so, what are the legal and algorithmic implications and ethical implications of that? It's an easy one to start with. That's a small question. <laughs> um, yeah, for civil with... disobedience. Yeah. Um, sure, well, I, um, certainly um, recording technology, right? Whether it's you know, undercover cameras, um, or audio recording has been used by activists forever to try to document, you know, abuses of power by the police, by others, and we've seen increasingly powerful examples of the way in which technology allows us to fight the kind of um, government story. Right, right? So it's and using your cell phone to record an event. Yes, that might have happened on a BART, right, yeah. on a BART station here. Um, and so, you know, historically and continuing, and I think that's going to continue fast to, to grow, that sort of use of technology. Um, interestingly, though, I think uh, recently people are becoming more concerned about the activities of their next-door neighbors and what the implications are for their own sense of well-being their own human flourishing, right? People want to be able to sunbathe in their backyard. And so we see things like the FAA right now looking to create a set of privacy policies to go along with the test sites for drones, um, the commercial drones, and some tension around um, hobbyists and commercial and, and what sorts of regulations there might be with lots of concerns in local communities about the privacy and other sorts of intrusions of quote unquote personal technology. And I think that's true around something like Google Glass too, right? That more concerns about kind of the interpersonal boundary setting and the way in which technology might disrupt that. Yeah, yeah. There is a removal of boundaries here, not only between people and people, but also between abstraction of data re-embodiment of data and with robots, right? So suddenly the server is now floating around among us. It's an interesting observation. The boundary issues being closed. Another comment? And uh, let's see if we have any questions here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just like for, for just to make a quick point about in, in the realm of software, you completely agree. In the realm of software agents, I see this also in, in terms of people who are now able very easily to have you know search algorithms that detect, you know, for you can you just search through Twitter and sort of find things that People may not have understood that as, as being public, but instead they're sort of, uh, you have activities that are, that, are, that are taking place online that are now very visible. You can, you can search out someone who's doing something. You can sort of, in terms of stalking, in terms of other sort of shaming, and uh, that's increasingly happening, so, yeah. Um, oh, be brief, yes, go ahead. All right, I can be brief. Uh, I just wanted to address your question, because I think it's a good one. You know, can, especially telerobotics, where basically you have this tool which is an extension of your body and you don't have to be where it is, you know, are there, are there privacy concerns? And I think absolutely. Um, but, but I think the technology is going to happen anyway, and it should happen because the, of the good it can create. I mean, we're fortunate with ROVs that we don't have to worry about privacy issues that much. There aren't many things going on underwater that people would worry about. I mean, you could find a few. <laughs> but, um, I mean, in... in Streaking? Right. Skinny dipping. Skinny dipping. In, in college, I had a, a, I mean, I believe that telerobotics holds huge potential as a tool for exploration. That's my kind of manifesto. In college, I had a robot called Esther, Eric Stackpole, Telepresence Rover. Anyway, it was this human-sized robot that had a camera feed, just like our open ROVs, but it could drive around, and you could see what it sees, and the camera was at human head height. Um, and I'd go to lectures with this from the dorm room, and because I was an engineering student, that was tolerated. Well, it was even appreciated, and sometimes people would screw around with it, but I'd I did have this one instance where I was in the dorm rooms playing with it, um, and I drove it down the hall and around the corner, and someone's dorm room was open. These are kind of like apartment type of dorms, and so I just drove in, you know, because it's it's you know it's a fun thing, you know. I'm not malice, and the people, you know, the doors open, so they know that they're gonna. And the people interacted with it, and I started driving around, and they were, you know they tried to like block the camera as as like a a joke. I hope no. I mean, you know, we were screwing around, and I, I drove around. I probably knocked some stuff over. Anyway, when I came back, there was this wrapped-up thing of brownies on the robot. They had left 
brownies for it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, they're leaving. Tro so then I put, I had some root beers, and I put the root beers on the robot and drove it back to the dorm, and they took the root beers. It was this whole interaction. Later that night, um, I got on the elevator to go back up to my dorm room, and all the people I recognized from their dorm um, got on the elevator with me. And I was, I was so excited. It's like, all these interactions we've had, this has been such a great time. I was going to talk to them about it. And I was kind of like getting all pumped. At, and I realized they have no idea who I am. They, they, ha they have never met me in person. I know everything about their dorm room. They've never met me in person. I kept my mouth shut and I just smirked. Um, so that was kind of an intro to that for me. But it, it brought up an interesting thing. I think that there's a lot of good that can come from this. And I have no idea how we're going to, how we're going to address it responsibly. Sorry, that was longer than brief, but I thought it was a good story for this. Okay, questions. Uh, yes, I'd like to, to raise the notion of uh, privacy very directly and bring in the, the notions of tradition and expectation which you mentioned. Uh, Forty years ago, when I went to London and England, I could expect not to be photographed, whereas today, if I go to London and England, my picture will be taken 400 times in, in the center of London. The question is, is the very notion of privacy one that is changing, and will it change, and where will it change? In other words, we, 40 years ago, we expect a certain level of privacy. Today, we expect a certain level of privacy. What will it be in 20 years' time? Will we expect less privacy? Why is privacy a constant? <laughs> Are you a plant? <laughs> um, so, An animal. Uh, I, I think that privacy is an essentially contested concept, right? It is, it is in many ways, it's a, it's a term, it has meaning, it's not without meaning, but part of its work that it does in the world is enable us to constantly visit and have debates about what it requires. And so part of what we do is constantly ask this question about what is privacy for? what ought it to protect, and in what instances are those things at risk. And as technology changes, yes, it's, this is an evergreen issue. We are always going to be, be debating what it requires. Um, uh, things that I think are very important with respect to technology, there's certainly questions about the collection of information, right, and who knows what about you. But um, Muriel talked earlier about autonomy interests, right, and, and individual self-determination, which is the, at the core of the understanding of privacy um, in, in Europe and is certainly one of our privacy threads in the U.S. And to the extent that um, our ability to collect information, not necessarily about you, but about your environment and about other people who we think are like you, and to make decisions that affect your opportunities, Right? That is a, a privacy concept that we're very interested in, and I think um, particularly the embedding of computers, sensors in physical environments, as well as the sort of data mining and profiling that we see routinely in the, the online world, um, raises real challenges because we, we want personalization, we want convenience, we want at some level to be known but we surely don't want to be disadvantaged and, or overly determined. And then we also have, beyond the individual's desires, we have these broader interests um, in privacy as something that is kind of constitutive of democracy. And we don't want to create these little silos, right, information silos, that end up undermining our public sphere, our understanding that we should have some interactions with people who don't think just like us. Right, so there's a, there's a lot of ways in which privacy interests come up. Privacy is used to protect many things, and it's important for many reasons, and we're going to continue to debate how to protect it. Thank you. Do you have any points on that? No? You're good? I yes? can say something. Yeah, it, briefly, and then we'll get to the next question. It, it'll, it'll be pretty long, but actually, I'll, I'll, let, I'll go to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll have to wait for the paper. Huh? Okay, next question. Go ahead. Um, yes, I thought the question was very good because take the difference between Google Glass and the undersea, underwater uh, camera. The big difference is that the underwater camera, this is individual people seeing things. So it's peer to peer, basically. Yeah. It's like what I share on Facebook, I can get concerned about what peers, what family, <coughs> sorry, what friends see what I show. That's called social privacy. But the interesting thing is that Google Glass, Google is looking with you and it's recording everything. 
Now, and that's an enormous difference. There's interesting research, uh, social science research, into the difference of privacy strategies towards social privacy and towards what is called institutional privacy. And it turns out that I think 80% of people who are on Facebook are changing their privacy strategy um, settings uh, eight times a week or more. So they have developed strategies for that. But towards what, um, in this case, Facebook knows and what it does, we have no idea. It's protected by trade secret and intellectual property. So the implications are totally different. And therefore, I think what you're doing is extremely interesting because all those implications are not there. Thanks for the comment. Um, that was beautiful. And, and one, let's take one more question and then let's go to break. Maybe be, yeah, great. Uh, this morning I received an invitation to the Internet of Things World Conference. So it, I guess it's now a thing. Um, obviously, uh, that's a big question. What happens when my toaster is talking to the world? <laughs> you'll, have to buy, you'll have to buy a new toaster every three years. <laughs> Better toast. Uh, do you want to follow up? Any no, other no. <laughs> Uh, can you, not so much privacy, but more the ubiquitousness of data. Stuff that was never private before is now so much more available to search through, whether it's phone books or tax records at your county office or your uh, donations to political parties or things that we didn't assume were private but were hard to get to. And can you speak to the ubi ubiquitousness of data, not necessarily from a privacy perspective, but just some of, there's so much out there that can be mined legally, even ethically, just because it always was, but it's just so much easier to do it. How do we look, where's the roadmap of that kind of thing, or where do you see, how do we deal with that kind of new world that we live in that was very different than previous? You want to say something? I, I have a general philosophy, which is don't limit it, adapt to it. That's, that's kind of my position on it. I don't elaborate on that, though. I mean, one of my one of my things about sort of the the quote big data is that I think that it's often that 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 term often is focused on the amount of data and not on the techniques that are used to sort of analyze it and that's one of the things I think we need to spend way more time on is not just what information is being collected but how is it being collated how are machine learning techniques coming in and making predictions on this not just sort of what Amazon thinks you're going to you know what book or movie you're going to like best. Um, but sort of how are those being co-located in order to make decisions? And, uh, and how is that changing the way that we understand ourselves? How does it understand we have algorithms? I have, you know, my entire music choices are delegated to basically a set of algorithms that, you know, Spotify and, and Pandora tell me what I want to listen to. And, and how does that change? I'm interested in sort of that, not just from an issue of sort of privacy, but also just culture. And in the case with music, you know, something like taste, how does that change whenever uh, it's being, when all, all that data is coming in and being, uh, uh, analyzed in that way. Yeah. Taste or mood, right? Now we know what mood you're in. Yeah. Great. Um, so, I mean, we could take court records as one of the canonical examples that historically they've been legally publicly available and as a practical matter, very obscure because they were in the basement of the courthouse. It was only open from nine to four and the clerk was kind of cranky and you had to go and right, so there were time and right, lots of transaction costs and accessing them. And in many ways, you know, some people are like, well, so we don't really care about any of the information that was in there. We've decided it was public. As the structural constraints or the transaction costs associated with discovering what was in them, right, that they weren't just available, they were easily discovered, um, we began to revisit. And, and now as a lawyer, if I file an electronic version of a document with the court, all the social security numbers, all of the kind of the details that they want removed have to be removed. The paper copy, they gotta all be in it, right? And so sometimes people tell me, well, we need technology neutral rules. And I'm like, well, unless the risks are different, right? And people have decided that while we want certain information to be available as part of the public record for certain purposes, the fact that it became so readily available on such a wide scale actually changed some of the calculus. And so sometimes, it doesn't mean that the minute you take down a wall, you need a law, but it does cause a revisiting of whether or not we need a different form of protection, right? We can regulate in different ways, and when we take down the wall, sometimes we do want a law. 
Thank you very much. My algorithm here says that 60% uh, of you want to go to the restroom, 50% of you want a cup of coffee, and uh, so I think we give a round of applause. But 100% of you are grateful to this panel. Thank you very much.